Good evening and thank you for joining us. My name is Don Gavin and I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Studies here at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the launch of SEIC's Visiting Artists Programme Fall Schedule with our Distinguished Alumni Lecture featuring William Cordova. And we're delighted to have William return to SEIC to share his work and experiences with you. The Distinguished Alumni Lecture Series was established in 2006 in partnership with SEIC's Office of Alumni Relations and has featured many talented alumni such as Sanford Biggers, Emil Ferris, Trevor Paglin and Jeffrey Gibson amongst others. SEIC's Visiting Artists Program hosts a variety of public talks by internationally recognized artists, designers and scholars each academic year to expand our thinking about contemporary art and culture. In addition to public programs, our guests meet with SEIC students for various engagements, and we're looking forward to hosting William for discussions with our graduate students, as well as our first generation fellows, an important undergraduate initiative here at the school. The undergraduate experience at SEIC is unique in that it allows students to explore interdisciplinary opportunities across an open curricular structure with no majors and each individual student defining their own interdisciplinary pathway or discipline specific interests. I'd like to thank Andrea Piero, the Director of the Visiting Artists Programme, for her work on this incredible series, which is a cornerstone of SEIC's public programming. So just a couple of notes about the format for tonight's programme before we get started. After William's presentation, he will be joined by Professor Lisa Wainwright to answer a few questions from the audience. To pose a question, simply post it in the Q&A below, and we will try to get to as many questions as time allows. Instructions are also being shared by our tech crew via the chat window. Closed captions are also available by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. So now to introduce William, it is my pleasure to welcome my colleague, Lisa Wainwright, professor in the Department of Art History, Theory and Criticism. Thank you, Don. Good evening. William Cordova traffics in magic. He can turn such things as paper bags, paint chips, vinyl LPs, used tires, feathers, reclaimed police cars, gold leaf, shoelaces, and worn books into stunning works of art that yield wondrously compelling narratives. He spins the detritus of society or draws its images into a personal iconography carrying a multiplicity of meanings, but always ones richly humane. Cordova is an SAIC grad, and so he learned some lessons well in that he crosses media promiscuously using everything from classic assemblage and drawing on paper to sending smoke signals off of a museum's rooftop or hiring a brass band from New Orleans for a video where the band plays a discordant melody to a silent statue of a Confederate soldier. From intricate paper wall hangings titled after Peruvian indigenous culture to other word plays in his titles, the language he pins to the works also contributes to his content, content addressing marginalized histories, migration and displacement, issues of communication, Afro-Peruvian cosmologies, and much more. And sound is key to his practice, the use of it or drawings of its transmission devices. For music is a mode of empowerment to Cordova. And Cordova is all about affecting change within the society through actions, aesthetic and otherwise. Cordova prefers calling himself a quote, cultural practitioner. And this is an apt moniker as his is a practice that is discursively powerful. He is a maker, a curator, and a mentor to others. And in all of these guises, he is, as he puts it, disrupting the mainstream or provoking people to consider things otherwise overlooked, end of quote. Cordova was born in Lima, Peru, and then immigrated to Miami, Florida when he was six, and as a way of coping with the violence and crime in the city of Miami in the 1980s, he devoured poetry, sci-fi, comic books. Indeed, he wrote and drew thousands of comic books, and these kinds of narrative motifs appear throughout his work today. Cordova learned much growing up with a mother who told folkloric and family stories every evening, with always a moral to each tale shared. And Cordova took this tradition adding aesthetic luster to the lessons his mother imparted. 
With all of this in hand, he came to Chicago, completed his undergraduate degree here in 1996, and then went on, went on to earn an MFA at Yale in 2004. From there, he sought out residencies to refine his craft and learn from various communities. A long list of prestigious residencies include the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Headlands in California, Skowhegan, the CORE program in Houston, and many others. Cordova has exhibited globally, including Gallery Florian Schoenfelder in Berlin, Project Row Houses, Houston, the 13th Havana Biennial, the 2008 Whitney Biennial. He was in Utopia Station at the 50th Venice Biennale in 2003, and the Perez Art Museum in Miami showcased his museum survey called Now's the Time, Narratives of Southern Alchemy. His work is included in super important collections such as the Whitney, the Guggenheim, and the Museo de Arte de Lima, Peru, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Miami, and La Casa de las Americas, Havana, Cuba. Cordova is represented by the prestigious gallery, Sikama Jenkins and Company. Cordova is also a curator, as I mentioned, many projects, I'll just name two. He co-curated the Greenwood Art Projects with Rick Lowe, an exhibition organized as part of the Tulsa Race Massacre Commission. And he's also been co-curator of the PRISM Art Fair, I think three, three years running, we'll have to check that with William. A nonprofit project focused on African diaspora artists, up during the big Miami Basel Fair, it has proved an important antidote to that fair's corporate vibe. And then finally, Cordova was just recently awarded a prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship, bravo, William. Like the mystical turn in some contemporary art today, the fabricated chimeras of Jimmy Durham, or our other alum, Daniel Tegeter, who just exhibited new tarot cards at the Armory Show this past weekend, the romantic sublime seems to be back as the enormity of our existence continues to elude understanding. So Cordova's sorcery, his alchemical transmutation of paint and prop into powerful form contributes to this zeitgeist. Like Rauschenberg, he ennobilizes the ordinary and in doing so, poignantly, hauntingly, soulfully, and beautifully attests to the social conditions of living today. Please join me in welcoming William Cordova for the 2021 Distinguished Alumni Lecture. Hello, thank you for that, Lisa. It's great to be here. So let's um, go ahead and get started. Okay, let's see here. So I'm gonna start and share many early works from school and then from uh, uh, grad school and jump to current times. It's just an overview of much of the work that evolved during uh, my uh, development at uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I transferred to the Art Institute of Chicago from Miami-Dade Community College, North Campus. So I entered as a junior, but the two years that I was at the Art Institute was uh, extremely transformative for me. So it's really important that I share this part. Coming in from Miami, uh, didn't know how to paint, didn't know how to do a lot of things. Um, but what I did have was desire, passion, and commitment. So. I always start my presentations with a photograph of my family, uh, very large, very diverse. This is a photograph from the 1940s. Uh, creative folks who knew how to problem solve. And that's the essence to me of what art can be. Uh, it's a tool, but creative practitioners, whoever they are, uh, not limited to the visual arts, can, can be uh, problem solvers. So, uh, so I always start with this photograph. Um, can we see the next image, please, um, Eden? So these are comic books from my collection. Of, uh, not a large collection, but um, quite a few. And it's important for me, to, for me to show these because I turned to comic books early on 
in the U.S. when I was living in Miami with my family. And it was a way of uh, coping for me uh, from the violence around us. So the title of X-Men might be popular now, but it wasn't necessarily in the know in the uh, early 80s when I was a child, as well as the Micronauts. And, and so um, my way of coping with violence was gravitating towards reading comic books, science fiction books, magic realism. And then that wasn't enough. So I ended up drawing out, making my own comic books. Can we see the next image, please? And here's a sample of a couple that have survived the time. I made over a thousand uh, comic books and, and little books, but I threw them all away, basically. Uh, I never shared them with anyone because they weren't necessarily for people to consume that way. It was more therapeutic for me. So next image, please. This is around the time that I went to, right before I went to the artist institute, I started doing a lot of text-based work. And early on, I did not pursue the arts in uh, community college. I was majoring in different fields and changing my major all the time because I was confused as to what I should pursue. Um, something that's stable, that makes money, that can sustain me, or something that I had a passion for. But the arts in general, not necessarily well, um, most people are not well informed about the visual arts. They think it's just something you do on Sunday and that's it. And for me, it was more than that. But I was just, I had limited understanding what pursuing a, an artist's career actually meant. So I did these text pieces on walls and eventually gravitated towards the art department at Miami Dade Community College. And the artists there, the faculty embraced me. Um, Pat Johnson, Robert Teeley, Pat DeLong, they shaped my creative drive in um, a very healthy, healthy way. Uh, that's very rare I've, I've seen since. And so they try to, uh, get me to paint, but it was very difficult for me to paint. So most of my visual work is text-based uh, at this point. And so we see the next image, please. This is probably the earliest piece that I have at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, my good friend uh, who also came from Miami to the Art Institute, Louis Gisbert. I didn't know him at the time but we were in the dorms. And so um, at the 112 Michigan building, he wrote, uh, there is no original thought on the bathroom wall. And one day I came in and drew a line over it. And that was in 1994. So in 2019, we were sitting around looking at photographs. And I pulled this photograph out and he saw it. He goes, hey, you documented my text. I said, I didn't know that was your text. I, I actually, I tagged that. And so we ended up realizing that this is our first collaboration. We would go on to do a lot of films together and other projects and we're still very close friends, but that was our first collaboration. So anyway, uh, next please. Most of my work at the Art Institute as an undergrad were short stories, magic realist stories, um, prose uh, like this, um, text on plywood. Next, please. And then eventually, by the time I was about to graduate, um, I started working on large sheets of paper, reclaimed paper, because I, I couldn't really afford the, the materials that one needs. But if you have drive, that's pretty much all you need. You, you figure things out as you, as you go along. So these are somewhat texts with uh, silk screens over them. 
and most of my themes had to do with history, uh, with landscape. Uh, landscape is a charged um, topic because it's, it's basically real estate. It's like wars are all about real estate. And so uh, history is uh, loaded with these themes and overlapping uh, themes. So a lot of these works were referencing certain classical music in relationship to historical moments in time. So they're functioning like soundtracks almost, but not to romanticize, but actually to illuminate the complexity and the uh, critical perspectives that some of these compositions were provoking, similar to, to tango music or American folk music. Uh, next, please. This is an image of uh, my working on text collaborations with um, a former uh, SAIC student, Bill, uh, Billy Adams. Uh, next, please. And by the time I graduated, I was working on postcards. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I didn't really have a lot of funding for materials. I have had enough money to pay tuition that my mom helped me with a great deal, but I didn't have access to a lot of resources. So I was working at Home Depot uh, by um, Second City at the time. And I started collecting free postcards from the 1-800 postcards and started making work on there during my, uh, my break time at Office Depot while I was still attending school. And so I used office supplies and I ended up making a lot of postcard works. Uh, next, please. So this is one example of uh, small four by six postcards. I used to type on them. So I used every single office uh, tool that, um, available to me at the, um, at the Office Depot. And so it's basically ink, pens, typewriters, liquid paper a lot. And I ended up using this postcard size work for about five years. I mentioned uh, earlier to Lisa that I was, uh, during my last year at the Art Institute, I was homeless because I had limited resources and I was afraid to tell my mom that I didn't have any money to rent a place. I worked at Office Depot, but it, that wasn't enough. Uh, working two days a week was not enough to sustain me. It was enough for some food, but that was it. So I would walk around with postcards in my pockets and just work wherever. And sometimes I would crash at the school and couch surf and uh, sleep in the subway system or uh, Kinko's because they used to stay open 24 hours. Um, one could say there's a lot of similarities in working with postcards and Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, I think Basquiat was coming into popularity at that point, resurfacing through Julian Schnabel's film Basquiat around 96. But I wasn't aware that he had, he was making postcards at the time. I knew him as an artist from uh, the catalogs at the Art Institute, but not that well informed about his postcards. Next image, please. So I worked for with postcards for about four and a half years. And I realized that I couldn't evolve critically on my own and then decided to apply to grad school. I just also needed that peer to peer exchange to um, just to push myself. And so this is uh, an image of a piece titled Machu Picchu After Dark. And it's 200 uh, reclaimed speakers that I picked out through South Florida in a year's time. And then drove them up to New Haven. And they became part of my show. So a large installation. And it's referencing Andean architecture 
and Afro-Peruvian vernacular architecture, uh, referencing the cajon, the, the Afro-Peruvian drum, which is evolved out of a discarded fruit crate. The Afro and Andean slaves were not allowed to use, to speak their language or use any kind of musical instruments at all. And so they found alternatives. And the hard-edged um, architecture, which influenced uh, Andean architecture, which influenced the um, brutalism architecture, architecture um, is something I always gravitate towards. So the structure was, uh, it's three-dimensional. There, there's different parts to it. Uh, can we see the, uh, the next image of the detail show? Right, so there's um, the records, the vinyl records, the shards of records alluding to data, alluding to repositories, information keeping, the gourds on top as well, but oral traditions. Uh, next image, please. These are large scale installations that I do of uh, works on paper. And you're not gonna find me also in the, the art supply store, usually at the hardware store or the office supply store. Most of the materials that I use are reclaimed materials from the streets or um, thrift shops somewhere. Uh, these, uh, 100 drawings titled World Famous Paintings. It took me about a year and a half to make. I started at this, uh, in grad school and finished them up at uh, Studio Museum in Harlem. And um, it, was, it was special to me because I was going back to drawing. Even though when I went to grad school, I was focused in painting. I went to the painting department. Didn't know how to paint. Can't figure it out. I wouldn't call my work painterly for sure. So I was more of a drawer and sculptor. And so can we see the next image, please? And then the next image. Okay, so, so I was working on a lot of these uh, eight by 10 drawings on reclaimed sheets of paper, pages from the uh, world famous paintings book from 1938. Uh, I basically peeled off the color plates that revealed a, a blank page. And then I did my work on there. And the back of the page is usually the name of the artist and the title of the painting, but I made no association with it. Uh, and the reason I picked that book was because the book was referencing only specific European countries, even though it's a world famous paintings. So it didn't, didn't include any other continents, any other countries at all. So my response to that was to insert ourselves into it. Next image, please. And this is um, an assemblage of different sources, different books, collaging and photocopying into one of the pages from the world famous paintings, a piece that I did. The next image, please. After I graduated from, uh, from grad school, from Yale University, I started doing a lot of residencies. But the first one I did was Skohegan School of Art and painting. And that one really put me in a meditative space that prompted me to reconsider my next step after grad school. Normally, I would think that I was going to go and find a teaching position or work somewhere near New York City, something to keep me close to the the art community. But then the residency at Skohegan was, uh, 
you know, it's, they changed me. So what I wanted to do is prolong that experience to take chances, to take risks without having to worry about uh, a day job, without having to worry about so many other things, uh, cost of living, et cetera. So I thought, what if I did residencies back to back? Long story short, I ended up doing residency for about 10 years from 04 to 2014. Done about 25 residencies back to back nonstop. It became an integral part of my, my practice. So this piece uh, titled um, The House That Frank Lloyd Wright Built for Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, Iatahualpa was uh, something I designed while I was at the core program in Houston. It was a two year residency program. And I ended up exhibiting it a couple of places and it was selected for the, uh, the Whitney Biennial in 2008. Can we see the, the next image please? This is a detail of uh, the sculpture piece. And what it is, it's a floral plan that I took from um, from a book of the inside of uh, where two activists, uh, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark in Chicago were assassinated by the Chicago police in uh, December 4th, 1969. And the two activists were Black Panthers, a Black Panther leader from, Evans, uh, from Chicago and Peoria. And they were asleep at the time and both were basically executed in their sleep. The, uh, the drawing, which is a floor plan, a roughly made floor plan, uh, is something that I incorporate into my work by creating the actual structure made out of two by fours. And, but not putting any drywall or anything like that, just leaving the skeletal spa uh, stage and allow it to function as a labyrinth, a place of transformation. And a labyrinth differs from a maze because a maze doesn't necessarily have a way out, but a labyrinth does. Uh, just like life is, can be like a labyrinth. It's, it's, it's a place of transformation, a space of transformation, whether it's physical or metaphysical or uh, psychological. And so that was the piece that I was interested in creating and in, uh, in alluding to Frank Lloyd Wright as a transcendentalist, as much as uh, Angela Davis was and how these uh, intersections uh, met together and provoked for me the idea of a meditative space of transformation. The next image, please. This piece I actually started uh, in grad school for La Laberintos uh, after Octavio Paz and Gaspar Yanga. And the piece started in 2002 when I found out that um, this Ivy League institution was not returning over 200 Indian, Andean artifacts to the country of Peru. Um, and so there was a legal fight. And in the process, I ended up, of, in the process of this legal fight, I went into the institution, um, appropriated or liberated, I should say, um, a box, a random box from the library. Some years later, I opened it up and it was vinyl records. So I created a labyrinth, a freestanding labyrinth that is uh, always different every time I install it. And what we have here is uh, one version of it. And let's see. So that was my way of uh, responding, not reacting, but, re but a, a response to that institution by taking um, those 200 Andean artifacts. Next image, please. Okay. And next image. Okay. 
these are somewhat of my version of uh, monuments. They're more like ephemeral monuments, uh, random imagery that one might not necessarily pay attention to, uh, laced with uh, aerosol art by uh, the pioneers of aerosol art, uh, like Lee Quinones and Dondi and Graham LZ and Lady Pink, uh, pioneers of aerosol art from the 70s and early 80s, who were not necessarily embraced after the mid 80s by the arts or art historians. Uh, they were seen as passe novelty artists. Not so anymore today, but this piece was done uh, in 2004 when I was finishing up grad school. And I was trying to uh, pay homage to those pioneers. And I decided to use gold leaf, fake gold leaf, uh, to allude to, to alchemists, to creating magic and transforming something that is not necessarily considered valuable into something that is, uh, uh, that is brilliant and that illuminates um, people or landscapes or themes that are often discarded or uh, shunned from. Uh, next, please. Uh, vehicles often come in and out of my practice. Uh, mind you, the rest of the images you'll see are all from residences, art residences. This one's from Art Pace, where I, um, I incorporated a, a former San Antonio Fort police cruiser into, the, into my uh, installation, entitled it Moby Dick, by uh, Oscar Wilde, Oscar Romero, the Oscar Grant. And the police vehicle was transformed into a, a miniature library. So the aerosol dart outside, I commissioned Marc Aguilar, a local San Antonio aerosol artist, to uh, tag the names of um, censored writers or artists, creative folks on the surface of the vehicle. And then the, the, the interior of the vehicle would have actually the books, the publications of all these writers. Sometimes all aerosol artists are called writers or taggers. So we literally had writers inside of the customized interior, which became a living space. So there was batteries in the trunk. You had um, a completely self-sustained interior, which I don't share with visuals because it's more of a sacred space. Again, a space of meditation, a transformation. And there were other components to this vehicle, but um, I might reveal those later on. Uh, next image, please. Oh, I should add that I collaborated also with uh, Carlos Sandoval de Leon, who's also an artist to Chicago alumni. Uh, at the time, he uh, worked on the in interior of the, that Moby Dick piece. Uh, briefly, this image is um, the intersection of the way that I grew up in Peru, how it shaped my worldview growing up in Peru in the 1970s. It's a very unique time for me and for many Peruvians, uh, one that does not exist anymore. And so my way of uh, representing that moment was through this drawing, which is uh, Tupac Amaru the first, Tupac Amaru the second, the first from the 1500s, the second one from the 1700s, Jose Condor Canqui Tupac Amaru, and the third Tupac Amaru, Tupac Amaru Shakur from the 20th century. Uh, no difference when, from any of them. They were all um, activists. Uh, liberators. Next image, please. This is an ongoing project that I've been working on um, with uh, science fiction, magic realism, the intersection between science fiction and uh, folklore. Uh, George Lucas' Falcon, the Falcon is a sacred bird. Of course, it's also the name of a vehicle, 
but it's also a bird and it's also uh, like the condor, uh, the eagle. And this piece I titled Yawar Malku, Lando Landu, and it references uh, sacred beings, uh, sacred dances. Um, Lando, Lando Calarician, in Peru, Lando is a, it's a dance, it's an Afro Peruvian dance, which evolved out of uh, Landu, which I'm from Angola. So as a child, when I saw the Empire Strikes Back, I thought Lando was Peruvian and the Falcon was originally his, his the ship, and he was using it to um, transport people, which is what I was thinking. Um, so I was thinking in a whole other different uh, place. Not to say that it didn't make any sense, I think it does. So some of the following images are components that contextualize this piece. Um, can we see the next couple of images? And one more. You can go forward. Yeah. Okay. And then I started also, I've been working with uh, audio since I was at Miami Dade Community College. But then I started working with vinyl records in 2006 and have been for the last 14, 15 years. This is one of uh, the pieces that I did with uh, Jerome Reyes, a Filipino artist from the Bay Area, where we uh, interviewed and recorded historical locations uh, in, uh, in the Bay Area, so in the bayous of uh, Louisiana, where uh, Filipino lived in the 1700s in the, um, in the bayous. And so we were recording those historical places that they were called Manila Men who helped develop the shrimp industry. Now this vinyl record is uh, an interview with a um, Filipino historian on one side and the other side is the sound of the, the bayou, the lake, uh, recording of the, the nature, the uh, inhabitants, whether they're insects, birds, uh, boats, um, or the wind. It was in a way, a project created by trying to decide how to capture this rich history without exploiting it, without creating something through sound that can't be exploited, can be marketed. And you can copy it, you can put it on online on different websites, and you can make multiple copies of it. But most people are not gonna gravitate to something like this and try to exploit it because it's not designed that way for that function. Uh, at least the audio isn't. And the vinyl record is only addition of three. So uh, next image, please. Another piece I did uh, later on in 2016 for the site Santa Fe Biennial was this small component, which is a vinyl recording of the Frank Lloyd Wright house, the Roby house in Chicago. And then the uh, 840 Armitage uh, address, which used to be the Young Lords organization uh, office in 1969, it's a Puerto Rican activist organization. And that church, it was originally a church. It was uh, eventually torn down, now it's a Walgreens. But I went there in 2007 doing a residency at Three Walls and recorded parts of those and photographed parts of them. Later on in 2015, I went back and uh, did the recordings again with Samantha Hill, who's also an artist to the alumni. And what we recorded was basically the ant hills, the, the uh, new social activism uh, activity of uh, ants living in the uh, ant hills in both locations. And I was interested in comparing that to the Young Lords um, socialist um, strategies that they created and also the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's um, transcendentalist philosophies, which are all interwound in many ways. 
Next, please. This is our samples of uh, an example of the, how the recording is presented. Next, please. This is a, a poster I designed for the Prospect 3 uh, Triennial in New Orleans. And it's a, it's a short 10 minute film that I collaborated with the Soul Rebels band in 2009 with Monique Moss and Monique Walton. And then uh, we actually videoed the performance. It's an impromptu performance, breaking into a building, going to the rooftop, having a face off of the statue of Robert E. Lee. Uh, it's a five year project that we shot in 2014. And, uh, we can share the video, a snippet of the video now. Next image, please. All right, so this is uh, an image synthesizing different uh, spiritual origins uh, in the Americas, in the Caribbean, Andean, Afro diaspora, and specifically also in Peru. Uh, next image, please. And these are gourds creating constellations on the rooftop of a sculpture piece that I created at the uh, Whitney Museum in 2018. Uh, the piece is called Huaca, uh, Sacred Geometries. And what it is, it's a ghost monument. Can we see the next image, please? And here it is, it's uh, the outline of uh, Waka, a sacred space in Peru, in the city of Peru. There's many Wakas. Uh, they're in a way pyramid-like structures built over 2000 years ago. And I grew up around it in our neighborhood. In our time, we could actually go into it and people lived in it or squatted in it. Later on, it became more of a historical um, space where researchers had, but not accessible to everyday people. And so I created this monument, this temporary ephemeral monument, the two by fours. It's, it's a ghost monument to that space with a constellation on the rooftop. The constellation is only visible through the higher of the uh, museum. And so today, the sun will provoke these line drawings on the surface of the floor that is constantly shifting and changing. And that was part of the design that um, it was a, a very fluid piece in a way. Next, please. Most of my work is installed in um, installation uh, like this. Uh, the large piece on the left is about 15 by 23 uh, feet. They're made with um, paint chip pieces that you, that you can pick up at any hardware store. 
I just spent a month working on it. And um, they're based on, uh, these are Rumi Maki pieces, uh, Fist of Stone in the interpretation from uh, Quechua, Andean language. And it's uh, Andean martial arts, like Asian martial arts that goes back thousands of years. And so uh, these pieces that I make are based on uh, different uh, Rumi Maki positions, um, battle positions. They're just completely abstract. Uh, if you think of uh, the Marcel Duchamp painting that that the name of the piece. But anyway, uh, descend, it, something descending down the stairs. I'm not butchering the title of it. Anyway, um, that's somewhat a loose interpretation of, it, of um, what might have influenced it. There's actually more influenced by cinema and uh, quilts and the end tunics. Uh, encoding information, cultural information, abstracting it. Next, please. And then in my conclusion, I made these uh, monuments to my first the boom box from 1985, the Lasonic 19930. Can we see the next image, please? So, interested in referencing Andean architecture, urban architecture, urban vernacular architecture, uh, the coming together of both the transformative power that radiates from both the influence, not only in contemporary modern architecture, but also in urban, how urban influenced um, culture in a, in a global level. This is from uh, the Havana Biennale in 2019. And that's it. Correct? It's the last one. I'm sure I missed a ton of things, but at least I'm right. Thank you, William. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm going to um, pull up some questions that have come in from the audience for you. Uh, yeah, I don't know how you do it. I just, I, it's talking into a flat screen without seeing, but maybe one person or two people, which are very generous. It's, um, yeah, I vibe off of uh, the audience. So I know. I know it's really hard. It's really hard, but you gave a you gave a good uh, uh, breadth of the work, and lots of lots of us uh, appreciated uh, you're coming into Zoom land to do it. Um, so, questions from the first one is from a Peruvian colleague, a Cesar Cruz in Peru. He said that um, he resonates with your story so much. He asked two really good questions, I think. The first, in the curator aspect of your life, what are you looking for from new artists? It's an interesting question. I started curating out of necessity uh, because I, I felt that uh, not enough artists of color, not enough female, artists were being represented. But also, there was a lot of ageism. A lot of older artists were not shown. And so I wouldn't say it was new artists, but seasoned artists, veterans, uh, hardworking artists who are just magical, but got lost, uh, were excluded for so many re different reasons. I never thought about it as a new artists at all. There's some, yeah, there's always uh, younger artists or students. I mentor a lot, so I'm always exposed to artists who are young, who are fresh, who are coming into the, um, into the global art community. But I, yeah, I never think about the new artists. It's not about that. Actually, I'm always thinking about my elders, yeah. 
That's nice. That's nice. Is PRISM still going on? And was it three years running or more? See, the confusion is that Mikhail Solomon, who created, is the director and uh, um, curator of PRISM Art Fair. She started it seven years ago. Seven, okay. But yeah, I've been working with them for four years. Yeah. Okay. So okay. that was the... Uh, Okay, got it, got it, got it. So from the same um, Cesar Cruz in Peru, the other part of his question was in the artist aspect, so that's a curator aspect, in the artist aspect, how do you find inspiration in difficult times and what advice can you give to new artists to find inspiration? Well, early on I mentioned that uh, I gravitated towards reading and, and comic books and short stories and Ray, Bar Ray Bradbury and as a way to cope with trauma or with violence around me. Um, when you're that young, you, 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 the, the brain is really something else because it always tries to adapt to things you know, in healthy ways, sometimes in unhealthy ways uh, as a way of coping. And because of that, I gravitated not to sports or other things, but to, to drawing, creating this discipline for myself. So that every time that I was stressed out, had anxiety, I would draw. I would just gravitate to drawing or writing. You do that enough times during your, you know, between, between age 12 and 18, it becomes part of you. And so there is, um, there is always that around us. You know, there's always that stress. There's always a community or global uh, situation happening. Ills of society are constantly at our doorstep. And so I don't wait for inspiration. I don't, inspiration is maybe like 1% or maybe less than 1%. The rest of it is just, uh, just being aware, being present, completely present and transforming everything and, uh, and channeling everything, yeah. So really struggling with your historic moment, getting in there. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a few sort of logistical questions. Somebody wants to know how you archive the work you made at the residencies. How I you, document everything. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You archive everything. I document everything digitally. I was documenting things since I was a child because when we came to the States, we didn't have anything but the clothes on our backs and some photos. And so I've always been interested in documenting my family, that documenting my life. Uh, I have great archives from the Art Institute of the hallways of my dorms, of other students, just random things. Now, I don't hoard these things. It's not like, taking a, a smartphone and just photographing constantly. It's not like that. Whatever I documented to me was precious. And so I've archived all that. And the residencies, a lot of times students don't realize, our students don't realize how important documenting is uh, because you need it to have, in order to reflect. You can't reflect on things you've done if they're not present. And photographing with a, with a phone is great, but also printing it and looking at it and sitting with it. It's very different than, you know, like having a conversation one-on-one -on -one physically is very different than having a conversation, virtual conversation. Because as soon as they turn off the screen, it disappears. It's not there. There's a different kind of value system. Um, and that is also applied to art making. So, so I've kept all these archives um, in digital hard drives or prints. And I'm always looking at them. I'm always going back in order to go forward because that's the only way that I can check and reflect. Yeah. Cool, cool. So uh, I'm, I'm channeling now. There's Renee Morell who's writing if that name means something to you. He says, hey, William or she or they, nice to see you again. I met you before in Samantha Hill's class at Harold Washington in 2015. Oh, 
Yeah, making sense. Okay, good. I was wondering why you choose all lower cases for both your name and the titles of your work. Also, since you focus on transformation, has COVID transformed your making process in any way? From, from last to first, I think COVID has transformed every form, everyone and everything. Um, there is no exception, even artists or creative folks who, who really cherish downtime, alone time, uh, whether you're a writer, a poet, a dancer or a, a filmmaker, musician, and a visual artist. Um, yes, it, it's a it's completely affected me. Um, but I, I can't tell you how exactly. Maybe ask me in five years when when COVID is globally under control. Um, in relation to the first question, what was the first question? Um, the first question was lowercase for William Cordova and titles, you and Bell Hooks. Indeed. Uh, yeah, I, I don't like to capitalize or associate my name with capitalism or capitalizing. Uh, simple as that. Yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Um, all right, here's a question. Do you mind talking a bit about the textile encoding culture in your works? Textile sure. enco encoding culture. Which part of textile encoding culture are you interested in? Which style? Style? I don't know. Can you explain what is meant by textile encoding culture? Oh, textile. Yeah. Well, wherever you might have textile, there's always the, uh, whether it's barbarian quilts or Amish quilts or African-American quilts or Andean quilts, uh, cultural rituals, traditions are encoded, are abstracted into these, uh, these forms. And so you might look at a Peter Halley painting and a G's Bend quilt, they, and they may look one and the same, even though some of them were made 150 years ago and uh, by African states in America. And another was made in the 80s by a contemporary painter. And so they're both functioning in the same way. It's about encoding information through abstraction. So abstraction has been around us all, you know, since day one. All we have to do is look at a flag. Most people say, I don't understand abstraction. What is it all, oh, you know, that's too foo-foo. But then you show them a flag, which just has colors and a couple of geometric shapes. They're like, oh, yeah, I, I know what that means. It means this, 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 and this, and this. And, you know, it's close to my heart. It means all that. And so, so to them, it's not abstract. You know, and like Rothko hated the idea of abstraction. For him, it wasn't about abstraction. It was about spirituality. And it's a religious moment. You know? And that's what it mostly becomes... Uh, to, to most people, what a flag is. Uh, abstraction in paintings or in quilts in my work is no different than that. It's just the, how you um, perceive these things, what you allow yourself to see. So, uh, you know, Barra Corot, who uh, was a video artist, pioneer video artist from the early 70s, um, she was a huge influence on my work because she was encoding uh, cultural um, symbols through, uh, through video, you know, because early video was very, pretty raw, that she was encoding these abstract forms into it as almost like creating uh, digital looms, or I should say analog video looms, uh, creating uh, these forms that are very similar to 1980s pixel vision, pixel vision uh, visuals. So Nice, nice. Did you study with Peter Halley at Yale? I did. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Peter's that's... great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's a question. Uh, 
how has the constant movement in your life influenced the architectural elements of your monumental pieces? Is there a relationship? Yeah, we grew up, uh, my family that is, we grew up uh, very nomadic in the US, constantly moving. You, you retain certain things and they become more precious because you, you rarely find uh, friends who have last names anymore. You just, uh, you become uh, in a way just uh, detached from so many things because you're a child and if you move that many times, you're afraid to, uh, to get close to people. And that happens a lot to, to immigrant families. They're constantly moving, looking for different jobs, different communities to, to get, get, you know, get by. And so because of that, we didn't, I didn't um, get attached to many things. So doing residencies, I was able to just um, go from one to the other without any reservations at all, without building, uh, building roots, yes, with the community, yes, with a lot of practitioners there and extensions of that community, yes, but I was not going to live there for that long period of time. I was just moving. And, and also moving a lot, having limited resources, limited access to you know, economic resources. I just uh, work in creative ways where I can construct, build, and also collapse and move on fairly fast. So the document becomes the piece more so. Pretty much like aerosol artists in the 1970s, all their work was conceptual because they made the pieces on trains, they photographed it because they knew within a day or two that piece was gonna be painted over. So the piece becomes a photograph. Martha Cooper, the photographer, uh, archived all of this really well because she also understood that it was on, it's their performative pieces that are not gonna exist anymore. So I have a similar approach to that. Uh, my roots are not from there, but they're almost parallel to that because I understand that I wouldn't have a studio, you know, uh, so many, most of my life I haven't really had a studio. It's only been through residencies in school. So I, I'll assemble something, build it, photograph it, and the piece gets tossed or uh, donated materials. And then uh, the photograph is what becomes the work. Yeah. So it's, that's an internal part of my practice. Yeah. Is that, that must be hard though. I mean, the, the, like the Whitney um, piece, the scaffolding piece to see that come, how long was that up and when did that come down? And did you, I would have wept. Not at all, four to five months. <laughs> I donate the materials to nonprofits, to women's oh. shelters, to, uh, uh, community centers that need it. That Millennium Falcon piece, all that wood was donated to the community. This is this one in, in Murcia, Spain. And so, yeah, it's that material is never discarded. It's always donated. That's very cool. That's very cool. Um, here's a tough question, William, that's like a Hans Hakka issue, right? Okay, here we go. So. Do you find it difficult to walk the line between working with systems and institutions while making art that is critical of them and why? So is it difficult to walk the line between working within systems and institutions while making art that is critical of them? The Hans Hans problem. Yeah, I think it depends on the person, the individual, the practitioner. It's no different than having a family. Uh, nobody has a Brady Bunch family. That's an illusion. Uh, families are complex. There is a lot of um, difference between one sibling, another sibling, between parents. There's all these layers to this uh, reality that we live in and we have to navigate it. And sometimes they're contradictory and we live with those contradictions and we learn how to navigate, respect, um, define space, have boundaries. Um, in family, you don't get to choose, of course. Um, but what, what is important is that you, even though despite you might not have 
you might not agree with, you, you respect and you, you draw lines as to how far you'll go, how far they can go, um, where they cross and where you cross. In the arts, um, you don't have to be there. You know? um, and at the same time, the art worlds, there's, there's many different dimensions to it. It isn't just one art world. Uh, there's not all institutions are the same and not all practitioners are the same. Everybody has different, complete different paths. It's no different than in the film industry, the music industry, um, poetry or writing or dance. There's all these overlaps. Uh, and the more you stay in it, depending on how you enter it, uh, it can be a very healthy environment. Um, but you know, it does rain every day somewhere. So it's, um, you, the more you're, the longer you stay in it, and the more present you are, the more you pay attention, uh, the better you are equipped with the proper tools. So That's such a great yeah. answer. That is such a great answer. I, I feel like we, we might want to end there. I mean, that was just a beautiful answer. And I think, I hope you got some of this at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where we also think about community very deeply and as a family. And I love, I love the way you answered that question. And thank you so much, William. That was amazing. Just amazing. Really great answers. And um, I know you have to stay up. It's an hour later in Miami and you have more work to do for the school tonight. You're meeting with first generation students and um, then tomorrow with grad students. So we're working you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, the Art Institute um, shaped yeah, what, who I am and what I do today. Uh, it built a community with me. It's, it's, it's a wonderful experience to, be, to have been there. And it's a wonderful experience to go back, even though it's virtual. Uh, I know. I know. We'll see you in Miami maybe in December, if the fairs are on, right? Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. Well, thanks everybody for joining us tonight for our distinguished uh, alumni talk with William Cordova and um, stay tuned for more uh, wonderful visiting artist programming throughout the semester and big kiss mwah, to William. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye, Lisa.